Apic says all your desktop apps are belong to Griffin, which is funny because there is another talk tomorrow in the morning that all uses almost the same title. Um, anyway, um, the abstract of the session said that it's related to Griffin, but it's also related to the bill. So the idea of this talk is to showcase how the Griffin project makes use of different uh, of other projects coming from the Groovy ecosystem. Now, of course, well, I'm going to center a few things about Griffin proper, and don't worry, I'm not going to show too many uh, desktop screens. I will not bore you with the details. I know that web and mobile are sexier than desktop, but trust me, there are still some uh, life uh, left into uh, these kind of applications. So without any further ado, uh, this is me. Uh, for those that didn't know me, this, I'm Andrew Salmerai. I come from Mexico. I currently live in Switzerland. I enjoy the, the most of the chocolate that I can eat. Yes, chocolate is the reason why I'm there. Uh, I work for the company Canoe. Uh, Canoe has been uh, an on and off partner and a sponsor with Greycom, so we're very happy to, to be here once more. I'm also a, a Java champion and a Java 1 rock star, which means uh, sometimes I say some things that people find interesting. I hope this is one of them. And I'm also one of the founders and current project lead of the Griffin framework. Um, and I love the Groovy. Okay, anyway. Um, there, I promise that I have something to say besides the, I promise to Soren that I have something to say uh, today related to Groovy and Griffin and GreatConf. So GreatConf and Griffin have a very interesting story. Uh, a few years ago, we made the, uh, one of the announcements of a one release on stage, I think it was 093 or so. Then we made a big 1.0 announcement right here on stage on this same very room, and we announced the ability of Groovy uh, Griffin in action, uh, first edition, there's no word yet on the second edition. And uh, we missed our chance last year to announce uh, Groovy uh, Griffin 2.0. But I'm very happy to say that we have something else. <laughs> we have Griffon 230 ready to roll today, right now. The binaries have been pushed to bin tray, and if I can find the link without my glasses, there we go. Uh, so I just click publish here. There, uh, I don't have any. Other. Come on. Yeah, no, 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 I need to select the different. So this is the thing, uh, when we change the, uh, the network, it always reverts back to IT guest, and you have to be on the IT conference, and uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, if, it's, if it doesn't break, it's not live, right? That's the, the point. Hey, there we go. So yeah, has published some snapshots. Those are the are Lazy Bones templates. We was going to talk about Lazy Bones in just a moment. And these will be the binaries. So just like that, Griffon 230 is out in the wild, and anybody can start using it right now. Come on. <laughs> Woohoo! OK, enough of this. I cannot, I cannot see anything. Don't worry, I, keep, I will keep wearing it later. After that, I guess now I, I can move around. <laughs> yeah, OK. Perfect. Whew. All right. So um, can, let's continue with the presentation. Uh, with that out of the way, we love making releases on stage live at GreatConf. Uh, so one of the reasons uh, Griffon came around was because we wanted to have the same uh, experience uh, that you guys had in Grails when writing desktop applications. Now, uh, Grails leverages a lot the Groovy language. So we decided to do the kind of the same thing. We would like to use Groovy as the main language. And for those of you that used to um, Griffon 1X or the previous series, well, everything was pretty much based around Groovy. There is one tiny problem with doing this is that if you want to deploy in an application to a device that is much smarter than a desktop, for example, a Raspberry Pi, Arduino, or something else that is capable to run Java SE, then uh, 
having the Groovy runtime, say, seven megabytes of, of memory footprint or maybe something extra, is not really that a good idea. So when we decided to refactor the framework, uh, we said, what if we were able to compress everything in just using plain Java code and perhaps move Groovy into its own external model or some kind of plugin? So this is the reason why we started looking at different tools inside the Groovy ecosystem to see how we can uh, refactor the behavior and the framework to be very Java friendly, to be as small as possible, but if you happen to use Groovy, then continue to have the great benefits of the dynamic language of the DSLs and whatnot. So this posed uh, a lot of interesting questions for us. How will we, should we need to split the build in such a way that there's only one side that deals with Java, another side that deals with Groovy? What would happen with the transformation, the AST transformations that we had in the past? Would it be possible to reuse some of that information in Java code? Well, if you rely on Project Lombok, maybe. But then, the, you know, so who were at the AST workshop yesterday? A few hands, and some of you know the AST transformations rely, the annotations rely on a specific annotation called Groovy AST transformation class. Now, this is the link that the compiler requires in order to find the annotation and the transformation that actually performs the work. So in order to reuse the same annotation, uh, with a, uh, perhaps Project Lombok or something that is not related to Groovy, then the, inter the annotation that you have must not be annotated with Groovy transformation class because the Groovy runtime job will not be available. So this poses a problem. How could you use the same thing in two different environments without pushing one jar into one space or the other? So we figured out that it was, there was a way and we use a lot of these projects. Actually, perhaps I should talk about this one first. This is the one that I'm talking about, Gypsy and with J and Gypsy with a G. What you usually see with uh, the AST transformation classes is that there are some metadata files that are generated for you, especially for the global transformations. Uh, you, you need to define the name of the class in a specific file, which is called Oracle has Groovy AST, AST transformation, uh, which is, has to be in a specific place, and the format of the file has also to be very specific. If you follow all these rules, your global transformation will be picked up automatically by the compiler and everything is happy. But it's a little bit tiresome to, uh, uh, to create a transformation and remember what is the location on the file and, and everything. And what if you refactor the class into another package or refactor the name, then you have to go back to that. So the idea of these two projects, they keep track of your classes. You annotate your class with uh, well, it's a very simple annotation called service provider for and the metadata files get generated automatically every time you compile your code. So the one for Gypsy works with the annotation processing tool that is available since JDK 6. So pretty much everybody, I mean, is it somebody still running JDK 5 in production? I hope not. So you already have access to the APT. And in the case of Groovy, well, we have access to the uh, AST transformations. So we make use of these two tools alongside these others to make sure that our build actually works as we expect. So I'm going to dive now into uh, the build itself and showcase some of the things that we have to do in order to make this thing actually work. Now, this looks very innocent. Let's see if I can zoom in and go there. It's a very innocent build. Uh, perhaps a typical Gradle build with has multiple projects and uh, the interesting thing comes here. Let's dive into sub projects and there are plenty of them. Then we look into samples and there are also plenty of projects. And then we look into documentation and there are a few other projects that don't happen to be or happen not to be a Java project. So it's a mixed of Java projects that we want to publish, these ones. These are the ones I just published to Bintray. There are some projects that we want to use as a control for testing or integration testing to figure out that what we publish is actually working. And there are some projects that just have to do with documentation. There are even some projects 
that deal with lazy bones templates. And these things are not Java, but all of them come together and somehow have to be uh, built and tested and managed and published and whatnot. So all of these projects have to be, as you know, in Gradle, uh, those projects in a multi-build project, uh, you have to define everything inside the settings.groovy file. And here we start to see one of the few things that we did differently. Our CI builds run in two different environments. Uh, Travis CI, I hope that most of you know this uh, one. So there are many options out there that you can choose from uh, to build uh, your projects on the cloud. Travis happens to be the, the friendliest one when if you host your code on GitHub, as this is the case here. And the other one there is called AppBayo. If you ever need to build something on Windows to test out your, your library, your project works correctly on Windows, then AppBayo gives you this option. So we're able to build this uh, project in two different environments, Unix, Linux, and Windows. So notice that each one of these environments will always expose an environment variable to, f to tell your scripts if you're actually running inside of the CI and which one it is. So in the case of Travis, it's just Travis with you know, all caps and app bay, you're also on all caps. If this is the case, this file is able to detect that it's actually running in each one of these CIs. Now because the settings Gradle file is a plain old groovy file, you can do this kind of stuff. So we're just simply saying, are we in that particular environment or not? And if we are, then we'll see something happening here Well, all these projects will be built. And if we are not, which is the case on this laptop, then I will be able to run a full build. What does that mean? That if it happens to be a full build, then I'm going to include additional projects. These projects do not need to be tested inside the CI environment. Because in the CI environment, I only want to take care of code coverage and uh, and to see if the, if the build is actually broken. But for the other ones, for example, documentation, we don't want to build it in CI, or publishing the templates or building the templates, it makes no sense to do it in CI either. So this is one of the first things we do. The other one you might notice is this snippet of code. I really like this kind of code because it allows you to change the default name of your Gradle build files to match a particular notation or convention that is exclusive or unique to your project. So how often have you found a multi-project build with Gradle where all the Gradle files are named build.gradle? And you keep open many files and then you have many tabs in your IDE and you don't know exactly which build Gradle file you're changing and eventually you change the one that you didn't want to change and then somebody commits that change, right? That is, that is a kind of a big problem. Right? So, first thing we notice is that if you name the root project, whatever you want, when I open the main build file, notice that in, at least IntelliJ IDEA, which is very smart, tells me that the name is Griffin. It doesn't say it is build.gradle. That's good. Okay, so that's one down. The other thing is that um, this snippet of code right here somehow knows that every single sub-project that I have is inside a sub-directory. So it will try to match the name of the real project and, and make sure that that is the name of the file. So for example, this project, Griffon Core, the snippet of code here will try to match that there has to be a Griffon Core Gradle build file. And if somehow I misspell this file and put something else or I make it back to build a Gradle file, my build will fail. It will say that the file that I was expecting to exist actually does not. So there is a problem with my configuration. Now I'm happy to open this build file and says Griffon Core Gradle, that's perfectly fine. Then I open another one and it follows that. And you can see the convention is the name of the subproject is the name of the file. As simple as that. And uh, because we have around 45 different projects in this build, you, you, can, you start to see the, uh, the reasons why having different names will be important. So, so this was simple. And again, the reason why we can do this is because this file, settings of Gradle, is just a plain Groovy script. You can do anything you want here. And it's run before the build. 
The second thing now is the, the, the bill proper. Let's make this bigger. Uh, who is still running a Gradle to zero? Or a very old version of Gradle. Okay, so you know that plugins have to be defined in this way. And since Gradle to one, we have a different way to define plugins, which is great. It's kind of like a unified way because core plugins and external plugins were exactly in the same definition, right? The problem with this definition is that uh, you must, this applies the plugin immediately once you define the coordinates. Whereas in this motion, the, the previous way, you can define the plugins in the class path, and once you really need them, then you apply the plugins. There are some plugins that have interdependencies, and it's important the, the order in which you define them and when you apply them. So we decided in our build, which is, as you see is quite big, uh, to be really, really sure when we want a plugin to be applied. So we use the old notation. Uh, we apply the Jacoco plugin, and this will be important in a moment, uh, when we try to create aggregate reports for Jacoco. This is something that does not come out of the box, and I wish the Jacoco plugin would allow us to do. Uh, all right. So the people, the sort of you that may be uh, using already JDK on production, who, who's using JDK 8 in production? A few hands. Well, you probably have encountered this, that the Javadoc tool is now very pedantic. If you do not define every single bit in the Javadoc, then you get tons of warnings. This is the magic snippet of code that you need to apply in order to shut down those warnings. You will still get the regular warnings as before, but not the very, uh, uh, I will say, paranoid warnings from the new Javadoc tool. Then, here we have another thing with configurations. How many of you actually miss the capability to have the provided scope from Maven? Not that many. So you never use provided scope with web apps? Interesting. So the idea of the provided scope is basically that you have a dependency that is used just at compile time. You don't want this dependency to be pushed at runtime or to the final pump, when in the case of Maven there is no way, everything is in the pump. But you don't want this to be consumed by another library. So the only way for us in Gradle to do this is to create new configurations. You can give it any name you want. Yeah, as a matter of fact, a hook app created this as the provided configuration. We decided to create two configurations. One to take care of compile time only and another for test compile time only. The reason why we have to is back to, the, uh, to the, what I mentioned before with the Gypsy projects. This will allow us to generate some metadata files just during compilation time and then these dependencies are gone. If you happen to define custom configurations with additional dependencies, it's very likely that you would like to see those dependencies in your IDE as part of the class path. If you do not do the following, then the dependencies that you apply to these configurations will be invisible to the IDE and you will get red squiggles. What you have to do is this. On the sources, whatever source set you want, in this case we only have the main source sets, we are make sure that the main source set has additional entries in its class path. And those entries come from the compile only configuration. The same thing we do for the test source set. We make sure that the test compile only uh, configuration is applied to it. So now all the jars from these configurations are available and visible to the IDE. You also have to do it for the Javadoc. And if you are running IntelliJ, then it's as easy as doing this. The scopes provide the plus and just add more jars to it. If I didn't do this, then I will have plenty of red squigglies on my IDE when I, whenever I try to run Gryphon. And if I try to build it, then the IDE will simply complain that it's not possible. Now, works with every kind of configuration. Uh, by the way, if you have any questions at any time, just let me know. There's another interesting thing. Uh, but you guys said that you don't use JDK 8 in production, but you might encounter the following problem later. If in a multi-project build, you have several projects that uh, depend on JDK 7 
to be the target uh, binary compatibility or others that depend on JDK 8. You may be tempted to say, at the root level, at the Gradle properties, uh, let's make the tar source compatibility and target compatibility 1.7, right? This takes care of all the problems. All my sub-projects use this. Perfect. Now I go into a sub-project, for example, uh, JavaFX, which I know requires uh, uh, Java 8. And there is. And everything's fine, right? Wrong. If your project requires Groovy for compilation, I can assure you, if you have JDK installed and you're running your Gradle build with JDK 8, your final binary com uh, will be compiled against Java 8. It will not be Java 7. Even though we said the root is Java 7. Uh, so for the moment, what you have to do is force the source and target compatibility. How do we do this in Gryphon? That's as simple as this. For every sub-project, you can do it in many, many ways where we are configuring all the sub-projects. For every sub-project, in the case we are just detecting that if it happens to be Java, then we know we have Java compiled and maybe we have Groovy compiled. Then we do this. We have to make sure that all the tasks of this type, Java compile, actually use the compatibility of the sub-project that we are currently configuring. In this way, this is the compatibility that is read from the sub-projects Gradle properties file. This is not the one coming from the root project. If a subproject happens to not have a Gradle properties file that defines the source compatibility, then it will use from the, the one from the root project, so everything is fine. And it's not enough to say Java compile. You also have to say Groovy compile. Because if you happen to have a joint compiler uh, working in your source code when you have both Groovy and Java sources, then I'm afraid that setting just Java compile will not do the trick. You have to also say Groovy compile. So now with these settings, the, this Gryphon build is able to assure that every project is compiled against 1.7, except those where we explicitly say we need 1.8. And this works. It's guaranteed because this, this was a problem in, in Gryphon 2.1 and Gryphon 2.2, we fixed this. <clears throat> so, there's another thing that we can see here in this build file is uh, do you ever want to see how the, uh, when you're compiling your Java code and your Groovy code, if there are any deprecation warnings? Usually when you have some deprecate uh, usages, then the, uh, the Groovy, out, well, the Gradle output will simply say such and such file use uh, deprecated uh, APIs, use X minus lint uh, to, to see it. But there is no real way to, to set it up, uh, at least explicitly on the command line. What you have to do is this. You have to tweak the compiler arcs for a particular uh, compiled task. In this case, you can see that we are catching both Java compile and Groovy compile with, by having, uh, looking for task of type abstract compile. And this, just by saying a property on the command line, uh, for example, let's go into, I'm pretty sure, let's see if Gryphon Core actually has something. Uh, Subprojects, Gryphon Core. When you say Gradle, I will have to uh, compile Groovy and do a minus P lint. This will be the new property. Then I expect to see any violation. Oh, actually, I know who actually makes one is this other project, uh, the Gryphon Swing, if I'm not mistaken. This one. Uh, will work, compile G or compile uh, Java. There we go. Lots of warnings. But if I make this false or I simply don't use it as before, then many of those warnings will be gone. I'm still making use of some private APIs uh, right there for, for Swing, but uh, you can see that now all the warnings were gone. And the only way that you can obtain these warnings back you know, on the command line is you do something like this. I mean, you can name this property whatever you want. The whole point is to make sure that you define these kind of properties and you make it optional unless you want to see tons and tons of warnings every time that you make your build. The last thing that we did is uh, 
Well, kind to, I kind of create two different aggregate projects for, for two plugins that are very useful. When you are releasing a project like this and this kind of framework, it's very important that you tell your users uh, what our problems may be for compatibility reasons within one release or the other. For this, we have applied the uh, clear plugin. Now, you remember what I said, that we defined the plugins first in the class path right there. And we apply them later whenever we really are sure we want to do it. This is one of the reasons. The clear plugin only works if you are talking, if you are dealing with a Java project. And as showed earlier, we have projects that are not Java projects. So blindly applying clear to every subproject will be bad. But also, we don't want to calculate binary compatibility for those test projects or those sample applications. We don't care about those. We only care about those that we really publish. So we keep protecting ourselves with some uh, Boolean flags, and this is the moment when we actually apply the plugin. Once we do this, we just configure that, and we also add every single sub-project that was configured with clear to a new list. This is a list global to the root project. The reason we do this is that we want to calculate and aggregate report of everything coming from every sub-project. And we follow quite the same trick when we want to aggregate Jacoco coverage reports right here. Uh, let me make it a little bit smaller. Uh, there we go. So this Jacoco report task is exactly the same type of Jacoco report task that you get from the default settings. Whenever you apply the Jacoco report, you get this one. But what is different is that we are configuring all the source directories, all the source files, all the class outputs uh, for a, a set or a subset of projects. Um, in order to do that, we need that uh, all the projects coming from these variables, these lists, project with coverage or projects uh, with integration coverage. Now, this list can be any, any name you want. They are created by the root project. And every time that we define that a project is uh, or requires code coverage, that subproject is going to be added to this, this list. And because of this, the root project has to be, or its configuration somehow has to be dependent of all its children. If it will be enough to say, these child projects use coverage, then on the root project, I, uh, I say, let me grab the list of all the child projects, then we will get in trouble because the children have not been evaluated yet. What you have to do is what is appears in this line, 248. Notice that most of the configuration that we had in the beginning here is just, well, as long as you find something, then you keep configuring, keep configuring, but until the build script reaches this point, it says, okay, hold on a second. I know I am the root project, but this is telling me that I need to wait for all my children to be finalized its configuration phase, and after that's the case, then I can continue. And it's just because we have this, then this root task will work. If I remove this, then we'll get in trouble. We're doing this because if I show you, let's see, uh, I think we have something in the, let's try perhaps juice. I think I already ran the report, so this will be faster. Uh, build reports, uh, Jacoco. No, okay, so let's do that. Great all. Uh, test, Jacoco, test report. I really love the fact that in Gradle you can use the short notation for invoking the commands. Like okay, we just did, JTR. And this generates uh, build reports, Jacoco, test, HTML, index. And it's just one package. This is what we expect. It's just coverage for this simple project. But if we want the aggregate for everybody, then this is where we run this particular task, the Jacoco root report, which if it's already existing, let's see, should be build uh, reports, Jacoco test index, HTML index. And now look at this, much better. I believe there is a similar trick that you can apply with Cobertura to generate an aggregate report. Uh, we prefer to use Jacoco because it gives us uh, much better uh, numbers for coverage and it, ha it is more detailed. 
especially with branch coverage. Cobertura says if I pass, there's a, a branch with two conditions, and you simply evaluate one, then the whole line is green. But in the case of Jacoco, if you only evaluate one of the two branches, the line will be yellow and will not be fully covered. So you have to write both tests in order to get the full coverage. So that's what we, we're finding out with this uh, settings. Uh, and kind of the same thing with the root report for clear. You can define a root a report for every subproject, but if you want to have an aggregate of everything, then uh, there is this additional task that you have to configure with all the different projects that you want to cover, which is kind of like doing this. Again, just Groovy script, you can do whatever you want here. And that's it. Uh, okay. So, um, there are a few things, other things that I would like to show you. Uh, do you write documentation for your projects? Why would we ever think of writing documentation for other users, right? Tests, uh, if we ever write tests, that is executable documentation. But if, if, you, if, if you really need to write documentation, then please don't use any uh, office-like tools to do it. Uh, try to convince your managers not to use HTML directly or, God forbid, XML. Uh, I will certainly recommend you guys to try out ASCIIDoc. This ASCII doc is a very simple format. Well, it's a text-based format that allows you to create really nice-looking uh, documentation. For example, the project that you see here, the Griffon Guide, uh, let's, let's show how it looks, and then you will tell me if it actually makes sense or not. Uh, I, I, I think it looks nice, but uh, some people will defer. Uh, reports, uh, no, this uh, is in the guide. Yeah. So, okay, HTML with a nice table of contents. You click on something and it navigates and you get a oh, syntax highlighting. Oh, that's interesting. And you get more syntax highlighting. Nice. But what is really nice about uh, ASCII-Doc, let's jump into one of the, there we go, the appendixes. I don't know how to navigate with my own browser. Uh, the appendix says, let's search for one of these sample applications, this one. Okay. This code that you see here. Oftentimes when we are writing documentation, and this kind of documentation which is technical, when we have to refer to a snippet of codes, we pretty much copy and paste from the production or from test into our documentation, then release the documentation, then say, oh, there was a bug in the snippet. Okay, let's change the test. Perfect, ship it. Did you change the documentation? Most likely you didn't. And that would be a problem. The moment that we start copying and pasting the snippets into the documentation, they will get outdated very, very soon. So what if there was a way to make sure that you can grab real production code or testing code and inject it indirectly into your documentation? Notice the words that I'm saying, injection. I'm talking about the snippets of code. This is kind of like we're doing programming of documentation. That's the whole point of ASCII, Doctor. You can program documentation. In order to do so, you make use of uh, a very simple uh, plugin, which is, uh, hold on. Oh, my computer just died. Oh, IntelliJ IDI is behaving silly. I don't know if you can actually see this. There. Oh, whoa. <laughs> okay, not that. They're really big. This jumps right there into your face. Yeah, the ASCII Doctor Gradle plugin. We love the Gradle. We, do, we love the ASCII Doctor. And with this plugin, you can simply say, well, here are my sources. Uh, right there, all my ASCII Doctor sources. Just transform that into HTML. The configuration is somewhere down here, uh, right there. These are plenty of things that we're doing. And we're done, right? Well, the, uh, the thing that I just showed for the snippet of code, uh, let me look at that. This is built in into uh, ASCII doc. These lines, these ones, are the ones that deal with this. So that's not very surprising. We're just using the tools as it is. What is surprising? Is is that uh, if I continue going down, I see this kind of output. 
You may remember this from Grails, from Griffon, from the days of old, right? So let's go into that sample directory. Because it so happens that the samples, that the code that we are injecting into our documentation is actually this. Uh, Swing Java. What well, is right here. So it's real code that can be tested at any time that we want. For example, Gradle, clean, test, and I'm pretty sure there's going to pop up some UI tests. Uh, compiles and then runs the unit test and eventually didn't run the integration test, I guess, because I didn't tell it to do so. So uh, let's run the integration tests. Uh, I should skip the tests, maybe. Uh, there we go. Inter unit test and integration test. You should see some UI popping up very quickly. Uh, don't you love that you can do this kind of stuff? Anyway. Uh, you can do stats. There's a plugin also that works with any kind of Java project or Groovy project. If so happens to be run inside a Gryphon project like this one, then it will give you additional information. We want this information to be also injected into the documentation. What can we do? Does anyone have an idea what can we do here? So we're calling this using a Gradle task, right? And the ASCII doctor plugin also provides an ASCII doctor task. Okay, maybe we can make the ASCII doctor task depend on this other task. Okay, that will generate this document, this information, but then how we inject back the information. Because this is how we do it. We make sure we create a new test, uh, a new task, right? where we grab a list of all the projects that, con that we want to depend on. This was done earlier, I believe. Uh, where is it? Uh, all my sample tasks are uh, here. Again, the nice thing about Gradle is that you can use any kind of groovy uh, behavior in the script. So this just dynamically generates a list of all the project names that I know should be there. And then, magically, I make the guide pr project depend on all of them. Okay, so now the guide can call any task on independent children projects. All right, so good. So then it calls this task right here. So this task will Im actually invoke this task, task on every sub-project. Okay, so now we got all the information. But the last thing is we need to fit it back into the ASCII doc. And, well, we just make the dependency and the important thing comes back into this ASCII doc document here, where it simply says, uh, where is the line for the inclusion? There, uh, there is. Just include a file that you know has to be in a particular directory. And that's it. So now you don't have to manually say, okay, run the, ta the, st the stats for these things, and then eventually the guy will use the right thing. No just happens automatically. Boom, everything is connected. That is the power of Gradle. So, uh, something else that we can say about the guide? I don't think so. We have something similar for the Gryphon side. The Gryphon side uses JBake and all of the projects coming from the Groovy ecosystem. Uh, JBake is very friendly to Groovy. It uses GSPs for the uh, templates. So, if you're used to doing Groovy server pages, then it should be very simple. And uh, uses also ASCII doc as the format. So what we do here again is apply, surprise, surprise, a Gradle plugin, the JBIG plugin, which will allow us to run JBIG inside the build. So what we do here in this case is uh, make sure that we have all the Java doc and all the guide information copied into another place and then build the site and then ship it to a particular place. If we were, uh, we're not publishing this through a secure shell, but we could pretty much use another Gradle task to, once we have the final version of the site, just push it to a particular location, and that will be it. Uh, what's interesting about what we see here is that this project, the Gryphon site, requires the guide, the, the whole documentation that we see here but it needs to copy it from somewhere else from the original place. So what you do here is uh, 
Yes. Right there. We define a new task on the site that pretty much makes sure that the guide task on the other sub project is called and once it's ready, it copies to a new place and once it's there, in this directory, then this other task site, which depends on JBEG, can do the work. So if everything is done correctly, I notice that it's also copying some additional information coming from some other place. So this is the final task that assembles everything in the documentation. So if I were to run this thing here, oh, let's make this shorter. Uh, we go into documentation, docs uh, Griffin site. We can do a uh, site and then site run. The site run task is pretty much just running whatever JBake creates as an output inside Jetty so you can see the thing. So, oh, well, it was already done, which means now I can go here and see the site live and all the, the links will work right there, including the release link right there. And the only thing that we need to do was this. Configure, configure Jetty Run and then add new, these new tasks. In this, instead of saying Jetty Run, I just simply say Site Run and make all the dependencies. Boom. Done. Simple as that. Questions so far? We're going good? Okay. So, finally, um, Lazy Bones. We make use of Lazy Bones to generate new Gryphon projects. In the past, we used to have our own archetypes feature that we molded around uh, the Maven archetypes idea. Uh, with Gryphon 2, we decided to let go our own custom uh, build environment, and we decided to embrace the native uh, build tool. So if you go with Gradle, you're going to get a lot of benefits. If you decide to go with Maven still, when we still support you. Uh, we would highly encourage you to go with Gradle. Now, the Gradle's team decided to create their own build tool wrapping around Gradle, which is kind of interesting in terms of compatibility with the, in the things that you used to do but it created also another kind of problems for them to migrate pretty much everything that is dependent on the build uh, uh, environment. So in our case, we simply say, we're going to break compatibility anyway with the uh, runtime APIs. Why don't we do it with the build time API? So let's break compatibility as much as possible, but try to retain the same feeling. And in order to re regain that capability of able to create com uh, projects very easily, this is where we make use of Lazy Bones. Um, if you haven't used Lazy Bones before, uh, it's as simple as, well, there is a Lazy Bones Gradle plugin that allows you to bootstrap everything also. Well, no surprises there. It's just a bunch of files, like you see here, with a magic script called Lazy Bones or Groovy. This is the one that assembles everything or renames files or creates files or creates everything based on the other templates that you see here. But given that many of our uh, projects or project templates are very similarly, uh, the only difference if you use Swing or JavaFX or some UI or the other, we encountered the problem of having duplicate files. So what we ended up doing was this. We create our common files in one place, and the root of each one of this, let's hear this, there's this share script, which pretty much says, I'm going to apply the Lazy Bones templates plugin. And this is configuration just to publish into be interact finally. But this is the interesting, interesting thing. For all the Lazy Bones related template projects, if it happens within this, if it begins with this name, then I will not do nothing. If I has this name, then I will do this or that other condition. Then it tries to copy different files. In this way, whenever we change one, well, if we want to upgrade, for example, the Gradle wrapper, for all these projects, we just simply change it here on the common one and then simply say package all templates and this script will bunch and put every file together. We round up everything uh, finally uh, by being able to run, um, well, let's kill this. Uh, well, if you use GVM, then all these tools are already available to you. 
So you know you can store Gradle and JBake and uh, Lazy Bones with uh, GVM. Sadly, there is no longer a way to install Gryphon using GVM because there is no such command line tool for, for Gryphon. So they're Gradle, Gradle and Maven. Uh, okay. So, oh, I failed to mention Spock. Well, we make use of Spock uh, in, in many ways, but there is one particular that I would like to show specifically here in the sample uh, projects. This, by the way, happens in any kind of project that you want. Uh, it's not anything related to Gryphon, that's the whole point. Uh, let's show uh, the JFX one. And probably let's go with the, uh, the Groovy one. Uh, I will show that in a moment. Oh, I see why you can't see it. Why not? Because this thing is going crazy. What happened? Okay. Oh, yes, exactly. Oh, I see. The, the mirror screen is off. Uh, arrangement, uh, mirror displays. Okay, we're back. Uh, show one to uh, PowerPoint for screwing my screen. As if that never happened before. Okay, so this is the thing. We have an integration a specification, right? Have you, ev do you know JUnit rules? Ever use JUnit rules? Yes, no, a few hands. Well. Turns out that your unit rules are another way for you to get around the uh, diamond pro problem of multiple inheritance. You can do whatever you want in, in a class. But the interesting thing is that you can use JUnit rules with Spark. If you didn't know this, here's one way. What this rule is going to do is bootstrap a real live Gryphon application for you, make it ready until a certain phase, and once that is done, then your tests will be able to work. This is pretty cool. And there is another kind of rule, a thing is the functional rule. This is at the class level. And you notice that we use here in a Spark the stepwise oper uh, annotation. With this rule, uh, actually, ah, oh, yeah, it's the rule, but it's being used as, as a spec uh, setup and a clean, a spec cleanup. With this thing, you're able to start an application once per test case and have all your test methods be executed in the same order. So the output of one test method will become the input for the next method. This is really nice for functional testing. Now you can apply the same kind of stuff if for web testing if you use JET, you can use it stepwise. And maybe somebody can create, a, I don't know if it's worthwhile creating a JEP rule so that this will become much easier to set up. But the takeaway of this is that it's very easy to combine what you know from JUnit, like J uh, rules, uh, with a Spark, like it is shown right here. And this can be any kind of rule that you want. All right, let's see if we see something here. Yeah, okay, finally it's working. Okay, so I only got a few more minutes uh, or less. I just want to say something about uh, JSR 377 and Gryphon. Uh, we started at JSR early in the year, which it wants to tackle uh, desktop embedded API for building uh, desktop applications or embedded applications in, in Java. So the JSR page is like that one. The website, surprise, surprise, is written using ASCII doc and Gradle. Following the lessons learned from the Gryphon side, we ported that to, to this. So, we already uh, kind of like dog footing the same things that we're doing in one project into the other. And I guess the JSR 37 site is smaller and simpler than the other. Uh, eventually, we'll like to release this kind of API so it'll become much easier for you to write applications that target, uh, again, Raspberry Pis, Boards, any kind of embedded device where Java SE can run, or just plain desktop applications like this one. Uh, okay. So uh, if you guys have any questions, I will be very happy to take them. But before that, thank you very much for your time. I know you, have, you guys have a choice. I'm very happy that you chose this one. And I hope that you continue to enjoy uh, the conference. We still have one more day for you, plenty of information. All right? Thank you. Uh,
And don't forget to, to give all the speakers your feedback because it's very valuable to us. So, you guys have any questions? Yeah. Yes. There is a yes the um, the effects. No, no. Hold on a second. Let me gather my thoughts. The yes, rule that exists for swing it is already there. The new release two three zero just added these ones for effects. And was that did that instantiate the, uh, the MVC rule or? Yes, okay. it is. It is a real application. It's live. You can do everything you want. Uh, you can, the difference between integration and functional is that in integration you still have the option to, for example, uh, this is something that is not yet documented and should be documented. There is, there are many classes that you can run inside Griffon and one of the most important ones perhaps is how do you run things inside the UI thread. There is an abstraction called uh, the UI thread manager, right? And I can say, for example, if I want to break this test, I want to run, uh, I don't have the swing one, say, okay. Say this is another kind of UI trade manager, and I want to override the default one. I simply say bind to, that's it. Uh, what? Uh, remove split type uh, UI trade manager, I believe. That's it. There we go. So this will override whatever setting comes from the, uh, the native application itself, right? This is not possible if you do functional, because in functional you really want to use the, the real application with the real settings. In integration you can fake things. That is the only difference with one or the other. And this should work, this kind of thing will, should work with Swing as well. I will have to come back to, there is no functional test for Swing yet but integration testing should work. Any other question? No? All right, well, again, thank you very much for your time, guys, and now I guess it's time to enjoy the meet and greet.